When it comes to the book of Job, you probably immediately think about suffering, and we should. That's just Job suffered. You may have experienced some very hard trials in your life in the past or even now. You may be very familiar with the book of Job if you've turned to it for a biblical example of someone who suffered and grieved and looked to God for explanations of what was going on here. Whether you are intimately acquainted with the book of Job or not, I hope that I will be able to encourage you with what I understand to be the overwhelming purpose of this book. And I want to present that purpose to you right up front, right from the get go. And I've stated it on the back of the cover of my workbook, but it is also going to be up here on the screen and it's on your handout too. So um, it says, while the book of Job deals with suffering, it isn't about answering the question of why do people suffer? We're not going to get that answer. The book of Job is about acknowledging that God is God. The book of Job is about humbly submitting to God as the Holy One who is infinite in wisdom, power, justice, and goodness. Those are two powerful and complex purposes. The book of Job shows us how to acknowledge that God is God. And then it shows us how to humbly submit to God. And in that statement, I singled out a few of God's characteristics that we are to acknowledge and submit to. His holiness, his wisdom, his power, his justice, his goodness. And each of those characteristics is presented in the book of Job. God has more characteristics than that, but those are just a few that are highlighted. You know, it's actually easy to say, God is God. You can you'd say those words very easily. Might even be easy to understand. I wonder if the trials of your life and the truths of Scripture have brought you to that perspective. God is God. You know your place before Him. You submit to Him. If that is the testimony of your life, hallelujah, because that's what God wants our lives to show, that we know that He is God and we're not. But a lot of people, and I'm one of them, <laughs> need repeated teachings that God is God. I know it, but I need to live it out. I can say it and I believe it and I will defend God and I will magnify his name. But sometimes I try to take his place. I believe that he is God. Job believed it too. Job needed opportunities to flesh that out, to let it be seen that he knew that God is God. And I need opportunities to flesh that out. The opening statement in Job chapter 1 verse 1 makes it perfectly clear that Job was a man who feared God and shunned evil. He feared God and his life reflected that fear. His behavior and his prayers for his children, even his reaction to all the tragedies showed that he knew God was God and that God could do whatever he wanted. Here are two of his incredible statements of faith. Chapter 1, verse 21, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He said that right at the beginning. And in chapter 2, verse 10, Job said, shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Wow. Job made these statements after the destruction of all of his property the deaths of his sons and daughters, and after the life-threatening sickness came upon him. We can say God is God. And I hope that you do say that. I hope you know that. I hope you believe that. But in each and every one of us, there 
is, while we're on this earth, the old self hanging around. And the old self is an enemy of who we are as a new creation in Christ. The old self is that sin nature that is in opposition to the new nature. And we often act according to our selfish self-centeredness instead of yielding and submitting ourselves to the Lord. And I want to share a verse with you from the New Living Translation. It's Galatians 5, 16 and 17. Paul says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Good grief. <laughs> that is true. Don't you know it? These two forces, our old sin nature and our new creation nature are always opposing each other. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world and he who and that old sin nature. The Holy Spirit is greater than that old sin nature. There's a battle going on in us and the Lord knows how to train us to win the battles by his spirit. The Lord knows what type of trials and circumstances we need to go through to expose our weaknesses and to expose our faulty thinking and to expose our self-centeredness. He already knows about it. He sees where the work needs to be done. and We need to see what needs to be yielded and submitted to him. So I suggest to you that the second aspect of the book of Job, I've already mentioned this, but it's to show us how to go beyond acknowledging that God is God and learn to see how to submit ourselves to the Lord, to submit to him, to trust his holiness and his wisdom, his power and justice and his goodness. Acknowledging and submitting. They might sound the same, but there's a little difference there. In James 2.19. Oh, where's James? Oh, I didn't put it up here. Just you'll have to listen to it. James 2.19. You believe there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. So demons and Satan acknowledge that God is God. They acknowledge that. They even submit to him when he tells, when God tells them what to do. They have to. They have to do what he says. But they remain in a constant state of rebellion against him. They don't humble themselves and yield in humility to him. We don't want to be like that. God has given us, who are humans, mankind, made in the image of God, God's given us the privilege of relationship with him. And through Christ, we have the freedom to choose to respond to God as we should and as he deserves. It's wonderful to praise the Lord when everything is great and you've got all this happiness and joyful things and you know good gifts that you see. And it's there are times where it's easy to praise the Lord and bless his name and thank him. That's acknowledging him. Acknowledging that God is God and humbly submitting to him and all that he is and submitting to all of his ways in those hard trials and in the pain and in the confusion. That's what shows the surrender of self to him. That's what shows deep devotion and faith. And that exalts God when you give him that sacrifice of praise. Here's where 1 Peter tells us about this. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
trials prove the genuineness of our faith. The trials put our acknowledgement that God is God into action. We want that. God certainly wants that in our lives. So one more time, the purpose of the book of Job is not answering the question, why do people suffer? But the message for us is to acknowledge that God is God and to learn that we're to humbly submit to him according to all that he is, even when we don't understand and God will boggle our minds. He's God. We're not. We cannot understand everything about him. So there are going to be times where all we can do is say, okay, and not understand. That's the overview, the big picture message. God has allowed me to have a little taste of trials. And when I look at what he's allowed in my life, I see how gentle he has been with me. He's let me have a little taste of trials that test and have proved my faith. The day before I began writing this particular Bible study, 10 years ago, the day before I started writing it, my husband lost his job. Whoa. He had said, I'm a little concerned about you working on the Bible study about Job. <laughs> What's going to happen to us? It was a very long year before he had a new job. It was a, a long, hard year before he had a new job. This summer, as I prepared to teach Job, I wondered if God would allow some trial to come into my life. And at the end of June, my daughter called to tell me that her husband, Chris, had just been diagnosed with kidney failure. Stage five, he needs a kidney. This is completely out of the blue. I had no idea there was anything going on. Just, it floored us. Chris has a genetic condition that has caused both of his kidneys to fail. And as I said, he needs a kidney. He needs a transplant. So our family is in the midst of a life-changing trial. I am so thankful that the book of Job was already on my mind, that God was preparing me, and I was able to say before the Lord on the day of that phone call after getting the news, blessed be the name of the Lord. I grieved. I cried. And still, I still can. Um, a little more stabilized right now, but back then I couldn't eat for several days. But I opened my Bible and I just said, here's what's going on with me, Lord. I need you to comfort me. And he did. I'm like, here's what I'm thinking. I need your help. And he comforted me and he kept showing himself to me. So I keep going back to him for comfort and hope and to strengthen my faith and to trust him and to wait on him. Because this is something that we don't know when the end will come for um, a kidney. These are the kind of things that you can wait for years before you find a match, before you find a donor. This trial that we're in has brought a loss of expectations. I mean, the day before, we were talking about travel plans. So I thought she was calling to say, hey, let's go here and there. No, no more travel plans. Um, that's trivial now, but it's just, um, we do, our, our whole family travels a lot, so it makes an impact on us. There are many unknowns in this trial, but God is good. And he is our God. And he knows what he is doing, and he knows why he's doing what he's doing in our lives. One more time, the book of Job is about acknowledging that God is God. <laughs> and it's about humbly submitting to him. Because God's word is rich and multifaceted, there are other lessons that we can learn in addition to this big picture message. And I want to give you a few things to consider. There are a list of questions and then I will walk through some brief answers to these questions. What was the purpose of the trial in Job's life? It's a little bit different answer than what I've been talking about. I was talking about the whole book. Now, specifically, what was the purpose 
of the trial in Job's life. And this is what Job really wanted to know. Why is this happening to me? Another question is, what was the purpose of Job's wife's attitude? Ay, ay, ay. Um, well, we'll learn some things from her. What was the purpose in Job's extended sickness? Why didn't God let Job die? Job wanted to die. He's like, just let me die. I, I don't have much longer to live. Let, go ahead and let me die. What was the purpose in the friend's counsel? Otherwise known as a tax. These friends were uh, not real gentle. What was the purpose of God's response to Job? He didn't answer the questions that had been asked throughout the book. So what was God up to with what he had to say? Well, let me give you a few brief answers to these as we're continuing an overview of the whole book of what's going on this, what's going on in the book of Job. What was the purpose of the trial in Job's life? We're given a very clear reason for the attack on Job. In chapter one, verse nine, it says, Satan answered the Lord and says, does Job fear God for nothing? And then in verse 11, Satan said, now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. So what we see now from the vantage point of the whole book of Job that God has given through his Holy Spirit, we know the backstory that Job didn't know. Satan wanted God to be blasphemed, cursed, hated, rejected. Mm -hmm. Satan wanted to deny God of the worship that is rightly his. He wanted to put Job in such a situation that he would only worship God on his own terms. Like, okay, God, I'll worship you if you give me something. That was Satan's mentality from the beginning. But Job endured all of this tragedy and suffering, and he did not curse God ever. He wrote Job, hooray. He <laughs> didn't do what Satan thought he would do. Ha! <laughs> Satan's goal in bringing the attack on Job was to deny God of the worship due him, but God flipped it around. He's so good at doing that. God used Job's suffering to bring glory to himself. And that was God's purpose in allowing it. God was never worried about how Job would respond to this trial. He knew his servant, Job, would. He knew what he would do. And whatever trial you face, God knows how you will respond. He entrusts you with trials and sufferings for his glory and for your good. That comforts me. The, another question that I considered was, what was the purpose of Job's wife's attitude? So let's think about her. You probably remember what she said as she grieved the loss of, the, of life as she knew it. She grieved the loss of her sons and daughters. She was grieving and she was grieving over what looked like it was about to be the loss of her husband. She said to him, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Job 2, 9. Her statement was a clear, blatant temptation from Satan. Just as Satan tempted Adam through Eve, here, Satan tempted Job through his wife. And I'm not saying she was possessed by Satan, just to be clear about that. But she was used to tempt Job. In the first moments of the tragedies, in the moments where the emotions were raw for both Job and his wife, this was a time when Job would have been extremely vulnerable to temptation. Satan put words right in front of him through his wife. 
Satan tempted Job right there. But Job did not take the bait. He did hold on to his integrity. And he held on to his fear of the Lord. And he held on to his trust of the Lord. And that's when he said, his, Job's response to his wife was, should we not accept the good as well as the bad from the Lord? Wow, what a leader Job was for his wife. What a faithful man he was. What was the purpose in Job's extended sickness? Why didn't God let Job die? Job chapter 3 is described by many as the most depressing chapter in the whole Bible. And we are going to read it and study it. Job curses the day that he was born, but he doesn't curse God. Remember that. Job cursed the day he was born, but he did not curse God. He expresses his emotion and his physical misery. And he wishes that he were dead. He, he is so miserable. In Job 3, 20, 21, he says, Why is light given to him who is in misery and life to the bitter of soul who long for death, but it doesn't come. And they search for it more than hidden treasures. In his commentary on Job, Elmer Smick says, the attack is on God through Job. And the only way the accuser can be proven false is through Job. Job has to stay alive. Job has to endure the suffering and not curse God so that Satan will see the faithfulness of Job and the glory of God. Job had to be alive and bless the name of the Lord and yield to the Lord when everything that was good was gone. This had to happen so that Satan could be proven wrong. This had to happen so that Satan's goal would be thwarted and crushed. That is a challenging thing. Job went through it. I hope Job went through it so I don't have to. I hope I can learn my lesson from Job so that I don't have to go through what he went through. But it does tell me that if, if God allows loss in my life, I want to praise his name and cling to him because I will have him if everything else is gone. I will have the Lord and I still have a future with him. Something else that I learned while studying Job and all of his suffering was that Job's suffering was a preview of Christ's suffering. In chapters 16 and 17, there are multiple parallels between the suffering that Job experienced and what Jesus experienced. So Job was a type of Christ, type Typology in the Old Testament is when a person or an event or even an object sometimes is an example of the actual person or event to come in the future. The blameless man, Job, who suffered for the sake of the glory of the Lord was a foreshadowing of the sinless man, Jesus, who suffered for the glory of the Lord. And he suffered, not just to suffer, but to save us from our sins. Job wanted to know, why am I alive? Why didn't you let me, let me die? Or why was I ever born? We know Job's life had a purpose. Even when his life was at its very worst, even when Job was in pain and misery and he was hungry because he couldn't eat anything, he was sleepless and he was depressed. At his worst, Job's life was valuable to God. Job's life was useful to God. It was eternally significant even in 
that awful suffering where Job felt like, okay, well, I'm no good to anybody anymore. But he was. Awareness of this has impacted me so much. It tells me every day of our lives is important to God and is eternally significant, no matter what. Every day is important. So I challenge you and encourage you to make a point to praise the Lord, to bless his name every single day, no matter what. And if you're not used to saying that phrase, no matter what, then this is the year we're going to be saying no matter what. On the worst days, on the hardest days, on the loneliest days, no matter what, praise the Lord. No one else has to see you or hear you do it. The Lord will know that you're doing it. I do like to think that Satan will see it and he'll hate it, but, you know, <laughs> praise the Lord. What was the purpose in the friends' counsel, those attacks um, that came from those? There were actually four friends that show up. Well, just as Job's wife was used as a tool to tempt Job, a tool by Satan, so too were his friends' tools used by Satan to try to tempt Job. The friends applied their limited knowledge to Job's situation, and they came up with the wrong assessment of his suffering. They determined that Job had sinned and he needed to repent, and if he did, then his life would be great again. So we know what's wrong. You sinned. Just repent. Friend number three is Zophar, and he is brutally blunt. He's the first that actually comes right out and says that Job is suffering due to sin. The other two are kind of paving the way. But Zophar says in Job 11, 14 through 17, get rid of your sins. Leave all iniquity behind you. Then your face will brighten with innocence. You'll be strong and free of fear. You'll forget your misery. It'll be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than noonday. Even darkness will be as bright as morning. Zophar was wrong with the action that Job needed to take. Friends number one and number two are Eliphaz and Bildad, and they had implied that Job was a hypocrite. He was a guy who tried to look like he was all good and upright, but was secretly a serious sinner. All three friends repeatedly pressed Job to repent of his sins so that God would stop punishing him. These friends only understood the retribution principle. They only knew God as one who would reward good behavior and punish bad behavior. And there is some truth in what they say, but it's all mixed up with wrong motives and wrong perspectives and a limited view of God. And God's going to let them know in the end they got things wrong. In chapter 42, he says, after, or the book of Job says, 42, 7, after the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. So God commends Job and he rebukes those friends. He calls them out. These three friends did not give good counsel and Job let them know it too. He said, maybe sarcastically here, Job 26.3, how you have enlightened my stupidity. What wise advice you have offered. Not. I think these guys had some heated, animated discussions. Job knew that if he followed his friend's advice to repent, then it really would be hypocritical because he'd be pretending that he had sinned. He'd be pretending to confess sin so that God would restore health and wealth and family to him. To confess sin that he hadn't committed would be bargaining with God. Like, well, let me just act like I did something wrong so God will quit doing this to me. That would be looking to God for things, for gifts, for blessings, rather than 
having faith in God for who he is and what he was doing. And just God, trusting God because God is God. Satan was using the friends to tempt Job to get out of his suffering by trying to appease God and get something from him rather than worship him for who he is. Well, while we are considering Job's friends, I want to show you the structure of the book of Job. And it is a presentation of the dialogue between Job and his friends. So April and Cindy, could y'all come help me, please? This is what I used when I was writing the study so I would know who was talking and where I was in the book. And um, hold it up as high as you can over there. So on Cindy's side there, I'll hold it in the middle. Uh, okay, the yellow on the ends are the uh, introduction and the conclusion and those are in narrative form. And then every other column here is a speech by somebody. So the blue is Job because he was very blue as he was suffering. He was miserable. And then Eliphaz comes out hard and strong. He's red. Another friend in the green is Bildad. Then this is Zophar in orange. And then so you see back and forth, back and forth. Uh, it's all in the form of poetry as well. So back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until Job has his final say. And this is also a, a biography of Job and then his fa final words. And then friend number four, Elihu, shows up and he's got more to say than anybody else, even God. He is very long winded. Um, you'll see Zophar only spoke up twice. But by, by the time we get over here, he's like, OK, I better be quiet. Um, and Bill, Bill Dad was was short and that's good, too. So then the white is the Lord. And while um, at the column, it's in two because Job interrupted him, but he responded briefly. And that was wise at the time. So God, what God says is amazing. We will, we will be looking forward to getting there <laughs> and we'll enjoy it so much when we do. But we're going to learn a lot from everybody else as we go through. And um, I've color coded my, my workbook, and my Bible and all kind of things. Um, so I'll know who's talking. So this is how I see the book of Job in my mind. And maybe you'll be able to see it this way too. Thank you ladies for helping me. Um, okay, we'll put that back. This will come back another time, probably. So, um, I, I love that. <laughs> it, is, it has helped me so much. When I wondered, where am I in this book? How many more lessons do I have? I could just look at this list. This is what chapter I'm in. Who's talking? The last question we're going to consider was, what was the purpose of God's response to Job? God's response to Job brought Job to his knees in awe and humility and in repentance of how he had spoken about God. Job's suffering wasn't caused by sin. But the suffering caused some sinful attitudes to surface. Job had been longing to talk with God. He wanted to bring him to court. He wanted to question God about his ways in Job's life. And God answered Job. I have a whole lesson in our workbook that is about that short little sentence then the Lord answered Job. Job had declared that he wanted to talk to God, but he thought that was impossible. And Job's friends didn't think there was any way that Job would get an audience with God. But God answered Job. He responded. Now, he did not answer the questions that Job had been asking, but God spoke, he communicated, he expressed himself. And he did it for his own glory and for Job's good. God answered Job with questions, not because God needed to know the answers, but Job needed to be reminded. Uh, he needed to know what these answers were. So the Lord asked Job, chapter 38, verse 2, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? 
Darkened means to be dark, black, dim, hidden, obscure. And counsel actually means purpose or plan. The Lord clearly confronted Job and rebuked him for hiding his purpose for Job's suffering by talking about something he didn't understand at all. Job, you've been talking about things you don't know what you're talking about. His speeches, Job's speeches to his friends and his prayers to God included accurate perspectives as well as words without knowledge. So he got some things right, but then he was, he was just in the deep end. The amazing, beautiful descriptions of God's power and control over creation. That's what God talks about in his uh, speech. These things reminded Job that if he could not understand how God takes care of the day-to-day -day rising of the sun. Do you know how I do that, Job? Do you know how the weather works, Job? Do you know how to feed those wild animals out there in the wilderness? If Job didn't know how God could do that, if Job couldn't do that, then how could Job think he could understand God's purpose in the suffering? God's question to Job convicted him of self-righteousness. And God said in chapter 40, verse 8, Would you indeed annul my justice? Would you declare me guilty so that you might be right? That's what was happening. Job suffered and he didn't know why and he knew it wasn't because of sin or hypocrisy. So Job justified himself. He defended himself so much that he just went all the way to the extreme and said, I haven't done anything wrong, but God has. He made himself the one who was right and God the one that was wrong. And that was wrong. <laughs> and he was convicted. After listening to God's amazing and the most amazing sense of the word, truly, God humbled himself and repented. You know what? God is three little letters and Job is three little letters. And I've caught myself a few times. And I get, I get, I say the wrong thing. So, Job humbled himself and repented of his words. In Job 42, 3 through 6, Job said, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. And I like the way the New Living Translation puts it. Job said, I take back everything I said. And I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Job's questioning of God's justice was what he repented of. So what was the purpose of God's response to Job? It was to convict and correct Job for the wrong attitude about himself and about God. God's response to Job was a gracious correction. You know, the friends had been saying, Job, you sinned and God has brought the hammer down, so you need to repent. When Job actually did sin and say he was right and God was wrong, God spoke and he talked to him and he was gracious. He corrected him mercifully. He didn't bring more suffering on Job when he actually convicted him and brought him to repentance. Well, I haven't mentioned the title of my study in this discussion so far. Job 42, 12 and 13 says, And the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and 1,000 yoke of oxen and 1,000 female donkeys. And he also had seven sons and three daughters. This, these verses tell us that God doubled Job's possessions and gave him a good relationship with his wife, obviously. They had 10 more kids. 
<laughs> and then in chapter 42, 16 and 17, it says, after this, Job lived 140 years. So that's adding to what he was. His age plus 140. And saw his sons and his son's sons for generation. And Job died, an old man full of days. And the Lord blessed Job. But the point of the title of this study is not that God was generous to Job after his suffering. This is on your handout. The Lord blessed Job before his suffering and during his suffering and after his suffering. So the Lord blessed Job all of his life. He blessed him early in life by giving him a wife and 10 children and a relationship with his God. Job talked about his life before the tragedies. He said, oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in the days when God watched over me, when his lamp shone on my head and by his light, I walked through darkness. I was in my prime when the friendship of God was upon my tent, when the almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. When my steps were washed with butter and the rock poured out for me streams of oil. He is remembering the good old days, but those good old days were good old days because he knew the presence and the fellowship intimately of the Lord. The friendship of God was upon my tent. The Lord blessed Job during his suffering. We need to grasp that. How did he do that? How did the Lord bless Job during his suffering? Job was chosen by God to show Satan that God was worthy of worship no matter what. The Lord blessed Job during his suffering by keeping him alive. Job didn't think that was a blessing, but it was. And the Lord blessed Job during his suffering by watching over him. The Lord heard every word. He never turned his back on Job. The Lord blessed Job by giving him faith and patience to endure the trials and the temptations. So the, the Lord was holding on to Job. And then the Lord blessed Job by answering him. That blessing came before the sickness, before all the suffering was over. Job is still miserable, and the Lord blessed him by answering him, by giving him a close personal encounter. And Job humbled himself and repented of his sin before God restored his health and wealth and family. So Job did not bargain with God for physical blessings. He didn't expect that. The very best blessing of Job's life was his intimate encounter with the Lord. James summarizes it all by saying in James 5, 11, Behold, we count those blessed who endured. You've heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. That's a summary statement about how the Lord treated Job. Could it be that the Lord blessed Job early in life and taught him to fear the Lord and walk in integrity and that the Lord gave Job great prosperity so that he could be the man who would cling to the Lord during the most extreme suffering and demonstrate before Satan and demonstrate before all of us that God is great? and worthy of praise every day, no matter what. God knows us. God blesses us. And he allows trials in our lives as blessings for us, for his glory and for our good. We may not understand all of his purposes. We may not know what's going on behind the scenes and we want to know. But we can always trust God. 
So as I said earlier, the book of Job is about acknowledging that God is God. It's about humbly submitting to the Lord as the Holy One who is infinite in wisdom and power and justice and goodness. I don't want us to forget the character of the Lord as we are studying this book. It's one of the the things that I delight in as I'm going through Job is looking at all the characteristics of God. Are you willing to take this journey with Job as he wrestles with pain and confusion and temptation even as he trusts that his life is in God's hands? I hope so, because you've signed up to do it. <laughs> so I hope that you will um, enter into this journey and embrace this challenging book of the Bible and come to the end and say, the Lord blessed Job and he blessed me too through this study.